so in our agency, we work with a lot of scientists and I see scientists and our legal team similarly in that they are essentially our headlights. Hello and welcome to the Agile Attorney Podcast. I'm John Grant. For this first season of the podcast, I've created a series of interviews that I'm calling the voice of the client. I'm bringing you the stories of real people in their own voice talking about the challenges and the successes they've encountered in dealing with lawyers and the legal system. I'm really excited to bring you today's episode, which is a definite change of pace from the last two. But I want to start by offering another comment on my last episode with Angel. Listening back, I noticed that I focused kind of heavily on what was going on in his relationship with this lawyer, and in doing so, I really skipped over one of the key things in Angel's story, which is the systemic challenges that people face in navigating the all-too-common issues around racism and sexism and inequality in the workplace. Those issues are very real, and they're ones that I'm really lucky to not have to deal with on a personal level very often, uh, but I'm trying to be better about seeing them, and I feel like maybe I gave them short shrift in my last commentary. So, Angel, if you're listening, my apologies, uh, and I'm really glad your current job seems to be working out much better than your last few. Uh, so, as I said, I'm really excited to bring you today's episode with Amy, who, as you're about to hear, really has only good things to say about the lawyers she works with on a regular basis. For me, it highlights what's possible when there's strong mission alignment and open lines of communication between attorney and client. Amy also disavows me of a false dichotomy that I was trying to draw between lawyers and scientists, so uh, I'll go ahead and take my lumps on that one. But overall, I really appreciate how she thinks about the role of her lawyers in helping her frame and weight the important business decisions that she has to make. So be sure to listen for all that and more right after this message. As I was recording the intro for this episode, I was saddened to hear about the death of anthropologist and author David Graeber. His first book, Toward an Anthropological Theory of Value, had a big impact on how I approach the work I do with legal teams who are trying to deliver better value to their customers and clients. Graeber had a ton of great insights, but the one I use the most is that there's a reason that most human societies use the same word, value, to describe the things they hold most dear, in other words, their values, and their concept of economic worth. If you want to better align your team's processes and activities with the delivery of real client value, I encourage you to book a 90-minute workshop with me called the Bottleneck Breakthrough Jam. It's based on the concept of bottleneck theory, and I've designed it to help you and your team develop a concrete plan for dealing with your worst bottleneck and opening up your value pipeline for delivering outstanding work for your clients. To learn more, go to agileattorney.com backslash bbj for bottleneck breakthrough jam. That's agileattorney.com backslash bbj. So my name's Amy. I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I have been working with a group of lawyers for about the last 10 years. Before that, I worked in conservation. And you work for a state agency, right? So you your access to lawyers is through basically other, they, they are also employees of your agency, correct? Well, actually, the state agency that I work for, we do not have in-house counsel. All of our counsel is provided by the attorney general's office. Okay, got it. So you're, you're working with other lawyers in a different state agency. That's correct. And do you work with outside with private lawyers as well? No, we really do not. Our, our okay. lawyers work with others' lawyers, but, but not directly now. Right. So what sorts of things, you know, that come up in your work life that causes you to need to reach out to the lawyers who are on your team? Well, so our work involves a really broad cross section of the law. So, you know, we have we work with international treaties. We work with tribal governments. We do real estate deals. We purchase land. We sell land. Because we are a large state agency, we have a significant number of HR issues. So right. we have, you know, employment law comes into it. Uh, we mm -hmm. have negotiations with uh, unions and with labor partners. We work with other states in, in bi-state agreements. And then, of course, we have contractual legal issues as well, you know, the purchasing of large items, small items. And then, of course, we have a significant amount of work writing rules and administrative codes. So right. the implementation of uh, legislative laws then falls to our agency and we work with our lawyers on that as well. So really, I mean, it's, I can't, there must be parts of the law that I don't work with, but I, I can't think of it right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. You've, you've got, you've got a broad swath. Well, so what sorts of processes do you have? Like when do you and your team know that, or, or how do you know that, hey, it's time to get a lawyer involved on this particular thing. And that, and that might be the HR thing. That might be the, 
travel negotiation thing? What sorts of like policies and procedures or whatever do you, do you have in place mm -hmm. for triggering that contact? Well, so one of the great things about the councils that counselors that we work with is that they they are really integrated into our executive management decision making. So we have a uh, one of the AAGs actually sits in our weekly executive management team meetings, and as we discuss issues, he is able to weigh in and say, "Here, here is a place where I think we need additional conversation," or "Hey, I think we should go back and look at." how this issue maybe played out in the past, or there was a recent decision. I think we should, we should, as an executive management team, you guys should probably look at it. So he is in real time flagging stuff for us right. and letting us know what might need additional review or conversation with our lawyers. Yep. So that's pretty helpful. And the, the lawyers that we work with are, they're very accessible to us. You know, that's that's one of the things that I really appreciate about them is that they are, and I've worked at all different levels of the agency. I, I'm on the executive management team now, but I, I started at the agency, you know, just as a field staff person. Mm -hmm. And really, if you have issues, you could always get help understanding what to do and how to do it. And that's something that has been really useful. So in our agency, we work with a lot of scientists and I see scientists and our legal team similarly in that they are essentially our headlights. You know, our scientists look up, look forward, and they are helping us understand what risks are coming through, through the ecosystem. They're helping us understand uncertainty, where we have uncertainty, where we need to mitigate that uncertainty. And I see our legal team really doing the same thing. There are headlights around policy issues and legal risk. And they just do an excellent job of flagging it without, frankly, without sort of like engendering fear. You know, like right. <laughs> there's not, it's not fear based. It's just, hey, this is something that we maybe want to think about because here's here's some ideas. You know, like it's it's very soft. The yeah. Learnings that we get, which allow us then as an executive management team who are kind of trying to figure out how to deal with policy to engage without it coming from a place of fear. Right. So it sounds like your lawyers are definitely not just the no people. Well, they are not the no people, but they are. So, you know, lawyers, there's a joke, you know, they're splitters from Splitterville. You know, they're, uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're hair splitters. They're exceedingly careful with their language. They are parsers of language. They know where the weeds are and they are happy to go and dig into those. <laughs> things, right? Yes. Which is really kind of the opposite of policymakers. Policymakers are generalists. And right. we work at a level of generally, how can we do this? And it's more about bringing new ideas together or packaging multiple ideas in a way that meets multiple either stakeholder needs or multiple ecosystem needs or multiple outcomes. Right. And that that thinking, that policymaking thinking of, of bringing things together to sort of meet the need is really different from how I think our lawyers think about it because they're sort of interested in teasing it all apart and putting them into, into smaller chunks that they can then kind of address so the, yeah. there is these two different ways of thinking. They do a nice job of sort of using their expertise to tease it apart and then help us rebuild it so that it makes good legal sense. Right. Yeah. It, it's interesting that. So I have a couple of thoughts. I mean, one is that it it sounds to some extent like having that that embedded lawyer on your team. One of the things I often hear from from attorneys, especially those in private practice, is that they would love to be in a position. And, and more it sort of embedded with their clients so that they can spend more time on fire prevention and less time fighting fires. Mm. Right. I think that's why we do it. And I don't yeah. know the history of, of how our, you know, our chief lawyer, I don't know how it came to be that he was going to be with us at these executive management teams, but it is certainly helpful. I mean, he, he is the headlights on the legal stuff and it, it does keeps us on the right path. So I do, <laughs> I don't know how we would do it without it because the truth <laughs> is, you know, as executives, we have so many things coming at us at any given moment that the place where we all fall apart is remembering who else needs to know this, right? Like I literally have a sticky note on my right. computer that says, who else needs to know? Because <laughs> where we fall apart is that we didn't tell that person that decision, or we didn't include that person in the decision. And that was a person that maybe wasn't the most important, but certainly important, right? Yeah. And, and I, think, I think our legal team could easily fall off the map because they're not, they're not embedded. They're not 
working with us in the same physical space. You know, they're in a separate agency. So it could be very estranged, but it is not because they're embedded in us in that way. Yeah. So not the, the sort of the opposite of siloed, which is, you know, by modern management theory, certainly something that everyone is shooting for to get, mm-hmm. get rid of the silos. I also find it interesting you know, that this idea of the, the twin headlights of one being science and one being lawyers, because they really do, they both have sort of an analytical, I mean, I think both professions have an analytical approach, but it's not the same approach, right? It really is different. And, and part of, you know, and I was a science major and, and part of what I find interesting about the legal profession, you know, we, in law school, we're taught the case law method of problem solving, which is basically try to pull apart the, the elements of a problem and then look to the past to see how similar problems may have been solved before and then try to sort of tease out a solution based on what that history is. And that works really well when it comes to sort of promoting the rule of law and hopefully ensuring stable society, but it really doesn't allow for a lot of innovation. Mm -hmm. Whereas scientists are looking at it in sort of this different way. And and there's an element of that with science too, and correct me if I'm wrong, but where there is, there's a much more experimental mindset, I think, for for science. And, And I know there are different branches of science and not all of it is experiment driven, but it still is analysis, you know, hypothesis, run the experiment, figure out whether it was right or not. So how, how, I'd love your thoughts on how those two headlights kind of work with each other. Yeah. Well, I think what you, the way you framed that there is a way of, of thinking that, that they're trained in is exactly right. I mean, we talk about at our agency, the idea that you go to PhD school, not to necessarily learn the facts, but to learn how to think. And the right. way you learn to think is that analytical approach. Uh, there's an element of reductionism, right? Like you you tease problems apart. You do always start with the literature. So perhaps in, in on the law side, you know, they go to the case law. In the sciences that, that I work with, everyone always begins with a literature review. You know, you, you go back and you figure out where are we at, who thought what, mm-hmm. and what do they think such that I can add to this body of knowledge. So I think, I think they're similar in that way. I think they're similar in the, an, the analytical mind. And I think they're also similar in that this may not be true. You can correct me on this one, but they don't nece- their job is not necessarily to solve the problem. The scientist is not the manager and the lawyer right. is not the manager. The manager has to solve the problem and the manager must look to the science and must look to the legal components of it to make the best management decision. But science doesn't offer the answer. Science offers a suite of risks, uncertainties, past experience, probabilities, but it doesn't, I don't know of a single case where science is so clear that you say, oh, I know the management choice because I read the science. It just doesn't work that way. There's other things you have to weigh. And that's how I feel about the legal side is that when the lawyers bring us the analysis of the problem statement that we're wrestling with, they don't have the answer either. You know, they have a suite of case law, they have risks, they have suppositions about how something might go down, they have their best professional judgment on what that might cost you if you go that way Mm -hmm. and, and who might respond, you know, and how they might respond. But in, in my mind, the, The greatest gift of our lawyers and of our scientists is to give us their best thinking and their best professional judgment about how this might play out from their perspective, but not to be so heavy handed or so advocates, not to be advocates, you know, to be to lay it out without assuming they know the full suite because they're carrying a very large basket, but it's only one of the multiple baskets that the managers have to weigh. Right. Yeah, that's great. That is interesting. I totally agree with that perspective. And it's it's consistent with how it was when I was working in the corporate world. I mean, I, th- I think we look to our attorneys for very similar things. In that job, we also had a good team of attorneys that was was pretty careful not to be the no people unless they saw that bundle of risk as being really extreme, right? In which case yeah, they would yeah. they would you know jump up and down a little bit. And I think that's valuable too, right? I mean, I, I, I'm sure, well, I'd, l- I'd love to hear, I mean, have you have you had an experience as a member of the executive team or, or in management where a lawyer felt really strongly about a particular direction that ultimately management decided not to take? Hmm. I've had some passionate arguments <laughs> with our legal team, but when they when they're super animated and passionate, my feeling is that I... I have stepped into great peril if I do not listen. Um, <laughs> right. So, so 
I don't, I am a risk taker. You know, I'm, I'm not risk averse, but if I have animated lawyers or animated scientists, right. you know, given me the, given me the steely eye, I, I'm not likely to go that way. And yeah, I can't okay. the time uh, when, when we, well, I've had, I have had the experience of saying, I hear you and we, for relationship reasons, we are going to take this risk because I believe that the, that the party we're negotiating with is trustworthy. You know, like there, mm-hmm. there is this, that has happened a couple of times where the lawyers say this, this is too risky. We don't think this is the way to go. And we have made the decision to continue down our path because we trusted that, that our partner on the other side wanted the same outcome we wanted and they didn't want to blow it up even though they could you know we have entered into agreements where you know there the document was never signed well the document's Mm. not signed the agreement's not signed it is now the moment when we have to do this thing are we going to do it Mm -hmm. and have moved forward and we've said well we're going to treat that document that unsigned document instead of as a a legal document we're going to treat it as a gentleman's agreement we're going to see it as the handshake because we worked on it the language is in there that we all agreed to, and they can't get it across their signature side. And we're just going to move forward in good faith. Right. So we have done that. And, and I think, frankly, as government, and when we work with our tribal partners in particular, I just think it's really, it's important to recognize the inequities that have existed in that relationship for so long that there, I don't know quite how to say it, but essentially the, the document signing has not historically gone in the direction of the tribes, uh, right. our indigenous people. And yeah. so there is a, there's a cultural reticence to it. And instead there is a cultural acceptance of the relationship and of the right. conversation and of we're in it together. And the commitment is to the relationship. And that document is almost, uh, can be, be perceived as a, a statement that I don't trust you. Right. Right. So yeah. That, I mean, it's- that, yeah. It's almost an artifact of colonialism. Exactly, exactly. And so, yeah. you know, our, our our legal system and our lawyers, they, they know this, you know, like they, they work with tribal governments, they know this, but it goes against their entire grain of sign the document, we worked on it, let's, let's codify, let's, you know, let's finish that work so that, so that we all can hold each other accountable. But in reality, the accountability is coming through the relationship, not through the document. Right. Right. Well, and I think most lawyers would tell you that that's always true. You know, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, the, the documents are often there to be the backstop, I guess, in a couple of situations. I mean, one is certainly in case the other side maybe wasn't being trustworthy or isn't trustworthy, but, but mm-hmm. the other, you know, si- situations change, right? The, in, any, any legal agreement is full of assumptions that, that you make at the time of the agreement that may or may not hold true. That's right. So yeah, that's that's fascinating. So tell me, uh, t- just getting back to the lawyers specifically, like what other things? I mean, I, I love the fact that you have sort of embedded in your group this voice of the you know the the legal matter to yeah. that's you know as much as anything, it sounds like issue spotting, which again, sort of you know, for a lot of lawyers I know, sounds like a dream job, right? Because that's what we get <laughs> trained for in law school is to issue spot. It's like, oh my god, I know exactly how to do this. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that, that I do love about the one thing that I appreciate enormously from our legal team is their commitment to mentorship. So mm. I, I don't know if this is true in the legal field generally, but it's certainly true in state government that we have a the baby boomers are retiring or have retired. Right. And that's a big part of our workforce. And we have new people coming in. And one of the things about and maybe this is true for all, I don't know, but certainly in our world we are working the same issues for 50 years. I mean, last year we resolved a land deal that was 120 years in the making. Like oh my gosh. it literally started just after statehood. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> so, and we just finished it. So like our issues are generational, right? Yeah. Um, when we are negotiating treaties, they are, you know, treaties with Canada, for instance. These are 10, 25 year treaties. 50-year treaties, when we are working on allocating resources with a tribal government. These are relationships and negotiations that have been ongoing for 40 years, right? So that legal counsel that we've had, you know, these, these 
these great thinkers with this enormous historical knowledge, and they know where all the all the little ticks and twitches are in these agreements, <laughs> you know, and they're retiring. And right. so our legal team has really taken on the approach of mentorship and they bring new people in and those new lawyers sit with us and, and they are silent for maybe a year and then they take a little bit and they take a little bit more. And we, we just are, I see the enormous benefit of that mentorship. And I, I don't know if that's just because we're government and we can do it that way, but it is such a benefit, and I am I am deeply appreciative of that approach. Yeah, you know, I it, it, it's interesting, and this is you know uh, obviously not true for a hundred percent of of private firms, but I think that's a real problem in a lot of private law firms where you know there, there's sort of an expectation, especially smaller firms, right? They they can't afford to take on the salary of a young lawyer without that young lawyer becoming sort of you know quote unquote billable right out of the mm-hmm. chute. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of discussion that comes, you know, up to the bars and to the law schools about the need to have lawyers graduate or or join the bar who are who are practice ready. And, you know, part of what I'm hearing from you is that for, for the work that you're doing in your agency, there's no such thing. <laughs> Yeah, there's no such thing. I mean, you just, you, I, we, the lawyers that come in that are new and young, I am sure they're incredibly competent people, but they don't know the relationships. They don't know yeah. where the bodies are buried. They don't know how we got to this place. Like they don't know who to talk to in our agency. I mean, part of it is just, who do I call when this thing comes up? I mean, just learning mm-hmm. who to call is a is a six month gig, you know. <laughs> do you see either within your agency or or within the AG's office? Do you see increasing use of technology to sort of perpetuate that institutional knowledge or capture that institutional knowledge? Mm, no, I don't see that. It, it may be hidden to me. I will say that. Because our our state has really robust sunshine laws around uh, public disclosure, that the AG's office and our our agency are uh, we have very robust record keeping, and so maybe maybe that maybe that helps. I, I don't know. You know, I'm not. Yeah. I don't know how to answer that question. What frustrations do you have with your lawyers? I don't have frustrations with my lawyers. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> they are. When I'm in crisis, I can call them. Any time, day or night, they are there for me. They are always willing to entertain my crackpot ideas. So like if I come and I say, hey, you know, I heard you say that we couldn't do that because of this law or that law, or because of the way the contract works, I have a new idea. What about this? And they are enormously patient and they hear me out and they say, we'll look into it. And then they come back. Like there's there's this stick to to our lawyers that I find enormously helpful where they don't give up on us. You know, they they keep on trying to find the path forward for us, despite all of our, you know, dead ends and cul-de-sacs that we end up in. And I think that keeps my frustration very, very low. Yeah. They're just, they're just competent. I mean, they're, they're competent. They win cases for us. They're, they're incredible communicators and they're collaborative. You know, I, my impression of lawyers, and, and I don't have a whole lot of experience with lawyers outside of the ones I work with, is that there's this element of competition or one-upmanship. Maybe I get that from the television or something, but you know, <laughs> that doesn't exist with, with our lawyers. They are absolutely the most collaborative group. You know, they, they, they are able to fill in for each other. They are able to help us. Like they're just, they're a team. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And again, it's, it's one of the things that I don't always see in, in private practice. And, and again, not universally, but I, it's not uncommon for there to be a lot of internal competition, even within a law firm, right? One one partner who, you know, was responsible for bringing in a particular client and, you know, expects to be either the relationship partner or to be, you know, compensated for work done for that client, regardless of whether they're the one doing the work or not. And it, it creates, there's often something of a scarcity mentality within mm. private law firms. And it's, it's funny, I've described it sometimes as a tragedy of the commons problem, especially in times like now where there's a little bit of, you know, where there's, there's economic downturns. And when work starts to dry up within a, a, some private law firms, the work that they would have given to, you know, an associate or a junior associate or a paralegal, they now start keeping for themselves mm-hmm. because you know they have billable hour targets and and their yeah. their compensation is often tied to it and you know it, it sounds like that is and, and I know this from from other you know government lawyers that I know that's not an issue with government counsel I mean they have to 
track their time and keep track of what they're doing, but they're not, you know, their their salary doesn't or their bonus doesn't ultimately depend on whether they put in their 1850 hours on billable legal work in a year. Yeah, that's right. That's that, that is true. You know, the the incentives that our lawyers that may exist in private law firms just don't exist in state service, which is, I mean, thank goodness, honestly, because we do need teams of lawyers and we do we do have this institutional knowledge piece that we really want to keep alive in them and, and having them perceive each other as competition would be counterproductive to sort of getting the work done. Right. I, I will say that one of the things that, that happens every year is that, you know, we, we do an evaluation cycle of all employees at the state, all, all state employees are supposed to be evaluated every year. And the, the head lawyer of our team that serves the, the agency, he does ask us for input uh, when he does the evaluations of his staff. And he sends us a survey and he asks us, you know, how are they doing? And in those questions, you, I have, I have come to see that those questions, of course, reflect the priorities of the, the AAG's office and its focus on communication and service and mission-driven and accessibility. And ah. um, it's been, I always appreciate it when those surveys come and I, and I take the time to do it because, well, A, I want I want those those folks I work with to know how much I appreciate them, but I also appreciate that it's even done. Right. Well, again, I mean, I, I'll I'll draw, and I know <laughs> this is so enlightening for me because so much of the feedback about private lawyers and outside counsel in particular is often that they don't ask for feedback, and that frankly they and I know this from my work on the Oregon State Bar the. The most common complaint that people have about their lawyers is lack of communication, lack of updates, right? Lawyers, at least private lawyers, are, are almost notorious for being poor communicators. And again, not, not universally so. And I think those who are good communicators stand out. But a lot of clients, including others I've talked to for this podcast, you know, that one of their most common frustrations is, I don't know what's going on. I have to ping my lawyer but I'm afraid if I ping my lawyer, I'm going to get billed for an email or billed for a phone call. And so I don't ping my lawyer. So I just live in this limbo of not knowing what's happening. Wow. That would be super challenging. <laughs> right. And it sounds like that's not an issue for you. <laughs> it is not an issue. We're going to have a flood of people wanting to either become government lawyers or go hire government lawyers. <laughs> <if they can. laughs> well, I do know, I do think that I just think about the amount of communication I get from my lawyers on each thing, like each step. So, you know, legal processes, they go on and on and on. Lord have mercy. Like, I can't even keep track <laughs> of how many steps there are from, well, someone's suing us. So, okay, that's like that's like step one of a 750-step process, you know? Right. And I am eternally grateful that that they allow me to ask them the same question like 40 times. You know, like, where are we in this? Is this the appeal or is this the court? Or did you need me to do that? Like, they keep me very, very organized. Like, here, here's where we're at. And this is going to be the next thing. And then now this is going to be the next thing. And I'm going to need you to do that thing when we get to the next thing. I'm like, okay, I can do that thing. Because that yeah. to me sounds a lot like project management. Oh, gosh. You know, I hadn't even thought about it that way. But it is. I, I wonder if they get trained in project management. Yeah, because it's that, I mean, you know, it, to some extent, right, you're a resource on their project, which is the the legal matter. Yeah. So. So if they're if they're managing you as a project resource, and of course they're going to communicate well with you. Huh. That's very interesting. You know, I'm going to ask them if they use project management software because maybe maybe that's why they're so good at it. I always thought they just had great memories. <laughs> they've, been, they've been like hiding the truth from us. <laughs> right. Uh, well, we, we we all have our curtains somewhere that, that we don't want to draw them back. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, again, I have to say this is this is such a different conversation than many of the ones I've been having because so much of in in the private world and especially with you know I would say smaller time litigants, right? Pe- people involved in the family law process or the the litigation process, it's an incredibly stressful time as an individual mm-hmm. to to be in those parts of the legal system. And one of their biggest complaints is number one, I don't know what those seven hundred and fifty steps are, mm-hmm. and nobody's telling me. Yeah. And again, it sounds like that is not your issue. No, no, that that one's <laughs> thank goodness no. That's great. You know, I wonder also if that may be a function of there are many steps along the various paths that I travel with my lawyers that are legislatively mandated to be on certain timeframes. Mm-hmm. Like this, 
you receive a permit, you have this long to submit to issue the permit, then you have this long to appeal the permit, and then you have this long before the decision, like maybe maybe working in such a legislatively mandated time frames uh, drives us all to be more precise or, or mindful of time and the steps right. because they are described in law often. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting. I mean, it, it causes me to think again of your science headlight too, because I mean, w- one of the things that I talk a lot about in my in my job, you know, my day job consulting lawyers and law firms is to think more in terms of what are your quality standards. So mm-hmm. r- rather than thinking about what is the thing I have to do, think instead about what are the elements of this task that will make it a high quality outcome, right? For for me or for my client. And and I think part of, and it's a little bit, you know, t- timelines aren't quite that, but they're similar, right? It's, it's basically mm-hmm. saying, look, we will have an effective, fair, good due process for this public, you know, th- this outcome that is for the benefit of, of the people of your state, if we follow these standards of practice, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. those standards can be deadlines, they can be formats, they can be other things. And, and, you know, I think you're right that to some extent having those what might seem rigid and even cumbersome in some levels actually does serve to create this quality standard that you can aspire to and, and helps create better outcomes for everybody. I think that's right. I, I, the way you describe that really resonates for me. And I think that's probably true in the science also, right? I mean, it's we're, we talk about and, you know, there's a standard for certain levels of, mm-hmm. you know, parts per million of different compounds that can appear in yeah. drinking water versus stream water versus wherever, right? And, yeah. and And having those standards in place is what allows for fair and consistent outcomes. I think that's right. I do think that's right. You know, and I I think the part of this we haven't really talked about is the mission component of the lawyers that we work with. I mean, I don't, the lawyers that come and work in our particular focus area are mission driven people. Right. Like you, you know, that they care very much about the outcome, like that the outcome be fair, that the outcome be in keeping with the needs of our state, that it be in alignment with our agency values. Like those things are very nourishing, I think, to all of us. Even when things are hard, we know that we're endeavoring to do what's right for the greater good. And and I right. think I think having that mission, it both keeps us in alignment with each other and it keeps our, our hearts in the right place when we have to do things that are hard. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, number one, that's just music to my ears because I, I talk about that all the time mm-hmm. and the need for having a, a a purpose to the work right it's not be, being a lawyer is not is not a an ends unto itself and finding you know whatever it is that you're passionate about whether it be service to a, a population or to a cause or to a community you, you're gonna you're gonna find more fulfillment in your in your job if you have that yeah that's right well th- this has been really great talking with you and, and hearing about you know sort of what's possible. And, and again, I, I, I've, I know that it's possible personally, but I know, I know a lot of lawyers that find a lot of frustration in whatever area of law they've chosen to practice in or, or however they've chosen to you know, sort of uh, find their uh, professional lives. And I, I think a lot of it does stem from there being a disconnect between maybe the things that they were initially drawn to law school or, or to, to, service, right? Because ultimately lawyer lawyering is a service profession. It is a yeah. it's a people profession. And it sounds like the lawyers you work with who who you have nothing bad to say about. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <laughs> right? And they they have this, you know, all of these things that you've talked about, teamwork, these values, right? The, the yeah. teamwork and communication and openness and and even with the sunshine laws, which I know isn't necessarily something that that you know, that's something that the, the legislature put in place. But even that, it sounds like there's some pretty good cultural understanding that that they're generally a good idea. They're a good idea. I mean, they're yeah. challenging, but of course we want the public to know how we make decisions. Of course yeah. we do. You know? Right. Of course. Well, I, I really appreciate having this conversation with you. It's been, I've learned a bunch about how this works outside of my little bubble. So uh, I really appreciate you sharing sort of your experiences with me. Well, uh, this is this is great. And I'd love to catch up more. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and hope to talk again sometime soon. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Amy. Bye. By listening back to that interview, I am still a little floored by how good Amy has it in her relationship with her lawyers. 
you know, I'm not saying that she or her lawyers are total outliers, but it's frankly pretty inspiring for me to hear about what's possible when a legal organization gets it right. I want to highlight one of the main takeaways that I think that most lawyers could really learn from from this episode, and that's the importance of having a good quality mission statement. You know, not only does it sound like the state attorney's general's office has a strong sense of mission and values, they reinforce their commitment to those values every year in their evaluation process and their feedback process. They also seem to recruit for lawyers whose personal values are aligned with the organization, which your business leaders will tell you does wonders for employee engagement and retention. Uh, I especially liked Amy's line that their shared mission you know, gives them or keeps their hearts in the right place when they have to do things that are hard. You know, so many law practices I see either don't have a mission or have this like crazy generic one. And I've done a few blog posts on this, you know, highlighting random law firm mission statements. And so many of them are like this crazy bunch of self-referential platitudes about value and experience. And, you know, that kind of like blah, blah language, it does nothing to tell clients or employees what the firm really stands for. And that leads to so many of the common problems that law firms can run into down the road. And, you know, I also think that it's the source of a lot of the burnout that lawyers feel, whether they're running their own practice or sort of toiling away uninspired in somebody else's. You know, the good news is that designing and, you know, I really term it as discovering your firm's sort of purpose driven mission statement isn't that hard if you break it down into the right steps. And I actually did a webinar about this a few months ago, and I'm making it available on my website. So. Look for a link in the show notes or go to agileattorney.com to find it. That's it for today's episode. I've been remiss in the last few episodes not giving credits. So I want to say thank you to Kenny Kingsbury for mixing and putting together the audio on this podcast. And thank you to Lee Duckworth for her production help and amazing organizational support. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast. Give me a review in iTunes or whatever your favorite podcast app is. It really does help with new podcasts to get established. And if you find these interviews useful, please spread the word to your friends or your colleagues. I'll be back soon with another Voice of the Client episode. Until then, be well and stay agile.